Today at six, he's resigned the final days of the Boris Johnson Premiership. I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. But them's the breaks. Flanked by family and loyal allies, Mr Johnson spoke of achievement, but not a word about his mistakes. He blamed Westminster politics. As we've seen uh, at Westminster, uh, the herd instinct is powerful. When the herd moves, it moves. And my friends, in politics, no one is remotely indispensable. The end looked inevitable as yet more resignations left his authority in tatters. The message from each one of them was the same. For me, the elastic uh, snapped and that's why uh, I resigned this morning and I sent a message to the Prime Minister very respectfully and politely suggesting um, that he should, he, should, he should go. Mr Johnson has assembled a new cabinet. He wants to stay in number 10 till there is a new Conservative leader. And arguments raged all day about just how long Boris Johnson can stay in Downing Street. Tonight he's promising any big decisions will be left to the next Prime Minister. Just over two years ago, Boris Johnson was riding high, but today he leaves a country divided about his legacy. I think he's lied and been found out and I think he should go. I don't think he's, he's not credible anymore. So I think he did a marvellous job. What he's done for the country, people don't realise. Who else could have done that? Who could have passed Brexit? Also this hour, foreign ministers arrive for the G20 meeting, the first with Russia since the start of the Ukraine war. And Ange Boer makes history as she reaches the Wimbledon final. Good evening and welcome to the BBC's News at Six. After the general election in 2019, Boris Johnson was the master of all he surveyed, with a huge mandate from voters. Today, he is on his way out, his authority evaporated and his integrity in doubt. Speaking outside Downing Street, he made it clear that he wanted to stay, saying it was his duty, but blamed what he called the Westminster herd instinct for forcing him out. Mr Johnson's plan is to leave number 10 only when a successor is chosen by the Conservatives. But opposition parties and some in his own party believe he should go sooner. Now, the end game of the Johnson Premiership began earlier this week with the resignations of the former Health Secretary, Sergeant Javid, and former Chancellor, Rishi Sunak. That opened the floodgates to a slew of resignations from government. Here they are, 58 in all. So even as the Johnson era comes to an end, attention is turning to who will replace him and how they will cope with an inbox that includes relations with the EU and the cost of living crisis. More on all that later, but first, our political editor Chris Mason on a day of political upheaval for Westminster and the country. Chris. George, just last night, Boris Johnson was exercising brutal prime ministerial power, sacking a cabinet minister. There was a defiance and a determination to continue, even a swagger. How things change. This morning, there was silence. Boris Johnson privately contemplating his future. And then the news that he'd be leaving. At breakfast time, there was talk of a constitutional crisis. A prime minister who wouldn't budge and more and more ministers resigning. But just after nine o'clock, news Boris Johnson would resign today. This, the most powerful street in the country, suddenly packed. Those arriving for work here, capturing the moment too. At lunchtime, a lectern. Those normally inside, outside. An audience awaits. And then a moment at once personal, political and constitutional. Hi, everybody. It is clearly now the will of the Parliamentary Conservative Party that there should be a new leader of that party and therefore a new Prime Minister. So I want to say to the millions of people who voted for us in 2019, many of them voting Conservative for the first time, thank you for that incredible mandate. And the reason I have fought so hard in the last few days to continue to deliver that mandate in person was not just because I wanted to do so, but because I felt it was my job, my duty, my obligation 
to you to continue to do what we promised in 2019. He fought hard and lost, his cabinet and his party abandoning him, but listen still to his defiance. In the last few days I've tried to persuade my colleagues that it would be eccentric to change governments when we're delivering so much. This was Boris Johnson forced to articulate that his imagined future here was being crushed. The boy who dreamed of being world king ejected. As we've seen uh, at Westminster, uh, the herd instinct is powerful. When the herd moves, it moves. And my friends, in politics, no one is remotely indispensable. I know that there will be many people who are relieved and uh, perhaps quite a few who will also be disappointed. And I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. But them's the breaks. That's life, Mr Johnson acknowledging. A painful personal moment, a splash of history unfolding too. Being Prime Minister is an education in itself. I've travelled to every part of the United Kingdom and in addition to the beauty of our natural world, i found so many people possessed of such boundless British originality and so willing to tackle old problems in new ways that I know that even if things can sometimes seem dark now, our future together is golden. Thank you all very much. What a moment. A man who won a big majority at a general election just two and a half years ago is going. Humiliated by his party, the Boris Johnson era will soon be over. Liar! Few are indifferent to Boris Johnson, a primary colours prime minister provoking colourful reactions to the near end. A great man brought down. A great man brought down. That's all I can say at the moment. Thank you. The, the country will rue this day. They, they regret it like they did with Thatcher. Exactly. Yes, it's, this will be a mistake. But plenty of others within the Conservative Party and beyond think Boris Johnson should be standing down as Prime Minister pretty much immediately and not just as Conservative leader. The former Prime Minister Sir John Major is among them. In a letter he wrote, the proposal for the Prime Minister to remain in office is unwise and maybe unsustainable. For the overall well-being of the country, Mr Johnson should not remain in Downing Street for any longer than necessary to affect the smooth transition of government. Sir John suggested that the Deputy Prime Minister could take over for a bit or a caretaker Prime Minister could be drafted in. Would Theresa May fancy it? <laughs> Look, I don't think, I don't, I, um, from everything I hear, and I haven't obviously heard recently, I don't think there's going to be a, 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 a caretaker prime minister in the sense of somebody else coming in mm. to, uh, to that, that role. And what does an opposition party leader do on a day like this? Well, one option is to smile and go and watch some tennis at Wimbledon, having said this about Boris Johnson. He needs to go completely. None of this nonsense about clinging on for a few months. He's inflicted lies, fraud and chaos in the country. And, you know, we're stuck with a, function, with a government which isn't functioning. There will be an overwhelming and very widespread sense of relief today that Boris Johnson's time as Prime Minister, which should probably never have been allowed to happen in the first place, is coming to an end. The problem is the Conservative Party, Conservative MPs, have stood by him for so long. They propped him up. They enabled him to fail to lead our country properly. Uh, and my heart goes out to the millions of families and pensioners who've not been helped properly because his government's been so incompetent. Attention now turns to those who aspire to come next in Downing Street, a fourth Prime Minister in a little over six years. Are you going to make a bid for the leadership, sir? There's the former Chancellor. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss is likely to be in the picture. Good morning. And perhaps the former Cabinet Minister Jeremy Hunt too, among others. A beauty pageant to lead the country is only just beginning. And after the intrigue and anguish, plotting and resignations, a leader departs soonish. Chris Mason, BBC News, Westminster. And we can uh, join Chris, who's in Westminster now.
Chris, in your time, you've seen some big political days. I just wonder how this one compares. George, this is a place all about power, Westminster, and every so often, and sometimes quite brutally, that power moves, it transfers, and today is one of those days. We've seen it over the last 48 hours, the rapidity of the draining away of Boris Johnson's authority. Yes, there was that defiance to try and stay put, but in the end, the avalanche of anger about him was so great it was going to sweep him away. His cabinet had deserted him and so had his party. This morning, I tried this by the way, it was impossible to make a cup of tea without at least two or three ministers resigning in the time it took for the kettle to boil. At that time, the Prime Minister was in Downing Street speaking to his closest aides and had determined that the time was up. But the intrigue continues because of this question about for how long he can carry on as Prime Minister whilst the leadership race is going on. He is emphasising tonight that he is a different Prime Minister now to the one of yesterday. Instead of using the full range of powers of a Prime Minister, he's effectively minding the shop. And for that reason, he says he should have the chance to continue. Chris, we'll talk to you later, but for now, thank you. Almost from the beginning, Boris Johnson's premiership has been dogged by controversy. His handling of allegations of sexual misconduct involving the MP Chris Pincher was, it seems, the final straw for his own MPs. Now, last week, Number 10 was asked whether the Prime Minister was aware of any other allegations before he made Mr Pincher Deputy Chief Whip. The answer was that he was not aware of any specific allegations. After that, time and again, ministerial colleagues like Theresa Coffey were sent out to defend that Downing Street line. But this Monday, the BBC revealed that the Prime Minister had in fact known that Mr Pincher had faced an earlier formal complaint. The following morning, Simon MacDonald, a former top civil servant, backed up the BBC story. And that triggered the dramatic resignations of Sajid Javid and Rishi Sunak on Tuesday, with dozens of other ministers and aides following since then. Our deputy political editor, Vicky Young, looks back at a turbulent three years in office. Riding high and doing what he did best. Boris Johnson on the campaign trail, persuading millions to back Brexit. <laughs> Many credit or blame him for the victory that followed. The pasty of independence. <laughs> he was a leading contender to replace David Cameron when he resigned after the referendum. But a close ally decided to publicly voice concerns about Mr Johnson's flaws. I've realised that while Boris does have those uh, very special abilities to communicate and to, uh, to reach out, what he did not have was the capacity to build and to lead that team and to provide the leadership the country needs at this critical moment. It was an early warning from someone who knew him well. He abandoned his campaign, leaving loyal supporters distraught. But his ambitions weren't thwarted for long. Theresa May's Brexit plans hit the buffers and Tory MP saw him as the man to get it done. He entered Downing Street with a team willing to ignore the usual conventions of politics. At the time, many MPs were determined to stop the UK leaving the EU without a deal. Mr Johnson asked the Queen to suspend Parliament, a move deemed unlawful in the Supreme Court, and kicked more than 20 Tory MPs out of the party. David Gork was one of them. He was prepared to adopt tactics that other Prime Ministers would not have adopted, to prepare to use language that other Prime Ministers would not have been prepared to adopt. Um, basically because he felt that the rules didn't apply to him. And the problem is that the approach that he took uh, over Brexit is also the approach that he has taken over other matters, personal as well as policy. To break the deadlock, an election was called, and the Conservatives won their biggest majority in more than 30 years. For his new government, though, everything was put on hold when it was hit by the worst health crisis in modern times. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. The Prime Minister himself became seriously ill with Covid. I, have a, I still have a temperature. He was admitted to intensive care and spent three days in hospital. 
A key ally throughout this time was Dominic Cummings. His unconventional style aggravated many. Sorry I'm late. And within a year of the election victory, he'd resigned after a bitter power struggle, clashing with Tory MPs and the Prime Minister's wife. He soon went on the attack, becoming Mr Johnson's fiercest and most damaging critic. He doesn't have a plan, he doesn't know how to be Prime Minister. And we'd only got him in there because we had to solve a certain problem, not because we thought that he was the right person to run in the country. Mr Johnson was criticised by his ethics adviser over the complicated funding of a lavish flat refurbishment. He infuriated colleagues by trying to water down rules on standards in public life to help a colleague, only to U-turn later. What have you done to this place? A heavy by-election defeat to the Liberal Democrats was the first sign that voters weren't impressed. Fundamentally, Boris came to Downing Street without an ideology, without a strategy and without a plan, then chose the wrong strategists around him. Uh, and I think that every time he got busted, rather than owning up to it, he did the usual Boris thing, which is to say, well, I'm not going to apologise and I'm not going to change and we're going to ride it out. He was kind of tied down by his own character. And, and in the end, actually, he proved quite inflexible. Last year, stories started leaking out about rule-breaking parties in number 10, while the rest of the country was in lockdown. After a police investigation, Mr Johnson was fined for a birthday celebration in the Cabinet Room. Altogether, over 120 fines were issued to staff. A report by a senior civil servant blamed a failure of leadership, and Mr Johnson was accused of lying about what went on. The final straw was a chaotic response to allegations of sexual misconduct against the Deputy Chief Whip Chris Pincher. Mr Johnson was again accused of not being upfront about what he knew. For some, though, there is a legacy to be proud of. I think we do need to recognise that he delivered on his promise to get Brexit done and he got us through the pandemic with the most successful vaccination programme in Europe, so there is much to be positive about. For many of Mr Johnson's colleagues, though, his downfall has not come as a surprise. Vicky Young, BBC News, Westminster. Before his resignation speech, Boris Johnson appointed replacements for those who left Cabinet positions over the last few days. The Education Secretary, Michelle Donnellan, who was in post for less than 48 hours before she quit, has been replaced by James Cleverly. Greg Clark has been appointed levelling up secretary, replacing Michael Gove, who was sacked by the Prime Minister last night. Robert Buckland becomes Welsh secretary, Shailesh Vara becomes Northern Ireland secretary, and Kit Malthouse becomes Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. They join cabinet ministers who have decided to stay in post, even though some had urged the Prime Minister to stand down. Now, the new cabinet are due to serve until the autumn when the Conservative Party hopes to have a new leader in place. So how does that work? On Monday, the election timetable will be decided by the leadership of the 1922 Committee of Backbench Conservative MPs. The rules as they stand today is that any candidate needs the support of eight Conservative MPs to take part. Then a series of votes among Tory MPs whittles the candidates down to just two. They then go forward to a vote of all Conservative Party members, around 200,000, who decide the winner and next leader. But who is likely to be on the initial ballot? Here's our political correspondent, Ben Wright, with the likely candidates. You could be hearing a lot from these names over the summer. The next Prime Minister will be picked by the Tory party and it's likely to be a crowded field with no obvious front runner. At Cabinet on Tuesday, Boris Johnson was surrounded by possible successors. Some have been campaigning quietly for months, eyeing up the top job, waiting for the gun to be fired. So who might enter the race? Well, there's Rishi Sunak, Chancellor of the Exchequer, until he quit on Tuesday. He is believed to be putting a leadership team together, but some Tory MPs are cross he didn't cut taxes. Sajid Javid has stood twice for leader before and was the first cabinet minister to resign this week. The Foreign Secretary Liz Truss has never hidden her intentions. She voted Remain in 2016 but has been a fierce defender of Brexit ever since. The grassroots seem to like her. Penny Mordaunt is a Royal Navy reservist and Defence Secretary under Theresa May, now widely thought to be gunning for the top job. And there's Nadim Zahawi, appointed Chancellor this week and ambitious as they all are. 
The government's top legal officer, Suella Braverman, has already put her hat in the ring and was gently teased about it by Labour. And can I say what an honour it is to be at this dispatch box facing the next Prime Minister as she waits her call from the palace. The list goes on. There's a lot of chat about Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary, and Grant Shapps, the Transport Secretary, is also seriously considering a run for leader. Boris Johnson plans to stick around as Prime Minister while Tory MPs and party members plough through the process of picking a new leader. But the rules for this election are not nailed down yet and there are Tory MPs who want to see Mr Johnson out sooner. I think what we need to do is appoint a caretaker this weekend, somebody who won't run to be leader. I really worry otherwise we're going to get into a febrile hot July coronation of somebody in a hurry. And are you going to have a crack at it? No, I won't be running. But I will be working this summer to make sure we get the right person. This is crucial. We're in the last chance saloon. This party's packed with talent. The public haven't seen enough of it. Restoring some calm after the chaos, rebuilding trust in political standards. The candidates will argue about the direction of the Tory party, but they will all agree the culture of leadership has to change. Ben Wright, BBC News, Westminster. It's been an unprecedented 48 hours in British politics, a record number of resignations. Just look at them all. Only last night, the Prime Minister was saying he had a personal mandate to remain in power. So what do the voters who gave Boris Johnson a resounding election victory less than three years ago make of today's news? Our political correspondent, Alex of Scythe, has spent the day in West Bromwich. The two seats there voted Conservative at the general election in 2019. The reverberations from Westminster echoed through West Bromwich as news broke this morning. Boris Johnson's going to resign as the Conservative Party leader. Good. Sir Hota, who's had a stall here for 20 years, voted for Boris Johnson's party, but now he's glad to see him go. Yeah, I think he should, should do that a long time ago. Yeah, he sorted the Brexit out. People don't want him anymore to stay in the Prime Minister. This market town in the black country is one of those that turned Tory at the last election after decades as Labour. Voters here took a chance on a Conservative Prime Minister who's lasted barely three years. Boris Johnson's going to quit. Gone? Has he not gone yet? There were quite different reactions from friends Mary and Janet. I think he's lied and been found out and I think he should go. I don't think he's, he's not credible anymore. But you don't agree? No. Because I think he did a marvellous job. I think he's been pushed today, definitely pushed out. What they've done is disgraceful. At this local pub, the Punjabi food came with a political twist. Lunch with an outgoing Prime Minister, and not many were impressed. He just can't tell the truth, can he? And he's just been caught out. He's got no cabinet left, has he? What did you think of his speech and the way he was then? No different to how he normally is, to be oh, honest. Really? He should have shown uh, some humility. Around Covid, I think that he did manage well, and I think, aside from right at the beginning, and I think, you know, hopefully some of that will be remembered, but we need to move on. Good riddance. He should have gone ages ago. You can't have somebody in the highest office in the country who you can't trust. <coughs> One of the local MPs was among those whose resignation piled pressure on the Prime Minister, resistant as he was to quitting. Boris Johnson's argument for holding on as leader was that his party would lose in places like this if he left. But in the end, plenty of his own MPs concluded they wouldn't win if he stayed. As the clamour starts over who comes next, the question's whether a replacement can hold support in different parts of the country. At this play centre, staff member Linda isn't convinced. He is Boris. I mean, I know he's not a conventional person, but I think that was part of the appeal of him, really. Definitely for me. Whoever comes in, they're still going to have a tough job trying to sort it out. There's certainly a mountain to climb, and while Westminster wrestles with the aftermath of Boris Johnson's downfall, voters, of course, have yet to pass their verdict. Alex Forsyth, BBC News, West Bromwich. Let's turn now to reaction from the UK nations. The resignation of Boris Johnson comes at a difficult time for Northern Ireland, with the government's controversial legislation to override parts of the Brexit arrangements about to go through Parliament. And that job now falls to a brand new Northern Ireland secretary. Well, let's talk now to our Ireland correspondent, Emma Vardy. So the people of Northern Ireland aching for some certainty. Are they likely to get it with uh, today's events? 
Well, of course, Northern Ireland is in a political crisis all of its own. It hasn't had a fully functioning government there since February. And getting one back was very much hanging on resolving the problems with the Brexit arrangements, the Northern Ireland Protocol that's created a new trade border in the Irish Sea. Now, the Democratic Unionist Party had indicated it won't go back into Stormont unless that uh, trade border is removed. And the party very much saw Boris Johnson as its best chance for fast-tracking through Parliament controversial legislation, which would go some way to doing that. So with him gone, things feel in much more doubt. And a big question for any new Prime Minister is, will they provide the same sort of reassurances uh, to the DUP, or might they take a slightly different, softer line, perhaps, negotiating concessions uh, with the EU? That might please the nationalist parties in Northern Ireland, but it could prolong the uh, political deadlock. Just one more thing. The outgoing Northern Ireland Secretary, Brandon Lewis, had been poised to force through the commissioning of long-awaited abortion services. So now campaigners there uh, will be looking to see how his successor picks up the baton on that. All right, Emma, thank you very much. Now to the other nations. In a moment, we will be hearing from Howell Griffith in Cardiff, but first to James Shaw in Glasgow. Relief is a word that a lot of people across the political spectrum have been using today. And Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister, echoed that, a sense of relief, widespread relief. She said that Boris Johnson was uh, going. But she said it was an unsustainable proposition that he, he would remain as a caretaker Prime Minister for an extended period of time. And that was actually echoed by the leader of the Scottish Conservatives, um, Douglas Ross, but not by Alastair Jack, Boris Johnson's man in Scotland, his Scottish secretary, who has stood by him all the way through uh, this crisis. He described Boris Johnson as a good friend and said that he was sorry that he was leaving. Now, there is one other question which is taxing people in Scotland. What about Nicola Sturgeon's proposed independence referendum, second independence referendum in October next year. Is it possible that a new Prime Minister might look differently upon it? Boris Johnson rejected it quite firmly very recently. In theory, yes, but in reality, it is hard to imagine a Conservative Prime Minister of the United Kingdom saying yes to an independence referendum anytime soon. And now to my colleague Howell Griffith in Cardiff. Well, support for Boris Johnson amongst Welsh Conservatives had pretty much evaporated before that lectern was brought out at lunchtime. His former trusty lieutenant, Simon Hart, resigned as Welsh Secretary last night. His replacement this morning, Robert Buckland, only took the job on the basis that Boris Johnson would go. When should he go? Well, the answer from the leader of the Welsh Conservatives here in the Senate is that it'd be fine for him to hang on as caretaker over the summer. He says that Boris Johnson has a legacy. He's probably mindful of the fact that the Tories won a historic uh, election here in 2019. More seats than ever before, turning so many of them from red to blue. So the question for the next leader is, how do they hang on to constituencies like Wrexham, Delian, the Vale of Cloyd, Bridge End? How do Welsh first-time Tory voters stay with them the next time around? The other question for whoever is next to lead the Conservative Party is what to do about the broken relationship with the Welsh Government. It's a Labour administration here, of course, you'd expect things to be tense, but it's become particularly fractious in the last year or so, with politicians here in Cardiff Bay claiming that the UK government is deliberately disrespecting the devolution settlement. All right, Howell Griffith, James Shaw, thank you both. Now, one of the biggest issues facing a new Prime Minister is the cost of living crisis. Today, the government's independent forecaster, that's the Office for Budget Responsibility, warned the debt in the UK is on an unsustainable path unless spending is tightened and taxes are raised. Our economics editor, Faisal Islam, is here to explain. Faisal. Yes, George, the government's own forecasters have a central message. There's not enough money to fund services for an ageing society over the next 50 years, leading to massive government debts unless something is done. This is down to several things, a slower growing economy, a declining workforce and population. At the same time, spending is set to shoot up on the NHS, social care and pensions as society ages. For example, now we spend less than a fifth of the value of the whole economy on a combination of health, social care and pensions. Those are the boxes in yellow, black and red. 
But over 50 years, that's rising closer to a third. That's hundreds of billions more. And if we have fewer workers and therefore less tax coming in, as predicted, that means a borrowing time bomb. So here's one stark example of why there'll be less tax coming in. Fuel and excise duty. The government would expect to get a huge amount here, £30 billion a year. That's the blue line. But because of the phasing out of petrol engines in favour of electric cars, that revenue is heading to, well, zero. Will it be replaced? Can it be replaced? And yet, right now, the argument over who becomes PM, the pressure is to offer immediate tax cuts or not to go through with planned tax rises. How much of all this will be tackled by candidates hoping to be the next Prime Minister? Let's see. George. Faisal, thank you very much. Well, let's go back to our political editor, Chris Mason, now. Chris, you touched on this uh, before. I just want to go back to this question of... Boris Johnson wanting to stay till autumn. How likely is it, do you think, that he'll get his way? Well, it's a very live conversation, George, this evening about the time frame for the election of another Conservative leader, how long that might take, because once that's completed, Boris Johnson can leave. And then the separate discussion about whether it would be reasonable or indeed sensible to have some sort of caretaker prime minister in the gap between now and a new Conservative leader being elected. On the timetable of electing a new Conservative leader, Downing Street are quite keen on this idea of it running all summer long and a new leader being in place in time for the Conservative conference. That's at the beginning of October. But speaking to people in the party this afternoon, you get very different takes on how long the race might take. One cabinet minister suggesting to me that it could be done within about three weeks if the MPs here at Westminster were able to decide who the leader was and there wasn't a contest amongst the Conservative Party membership. Around 100,000 uh, people, a tiniest, thinnest slither of the electorate, of course, in total, and one that by definition is very unrepresentative of the nation at large. But they, potentially, and Conservative MPs, will pick the next Prime Minister on our behalf. All right, Chris, thanks very much. Now, from Brexit to providing assistance to Ukraine, Boris Johnson has promoted an image of global Britain on the world stage. So what has the reaction been to his resignation? Our diplomatic correspondent, Caroline Hawley, looks at his reputation beyond the UK. Boris Johnson serait donc voilà. sur le point de démissionner. The British government is in turmoil this morning. Prime Minister Boris Johnson, a key ally, announces that he is resigning. The downfall of Boris Johnson has made international headlines. The Prime Minister, who as a child wanted to be king of the world, who took the UK out of the EU and promoted the country as global Britain. It is time to change the record, to recover our natural and historic role as an enterprising, outward-looking and truly global Britain, generous in temper and engaged with the world. The crisis in Ukraine has provided Boris Johnson an opportunity to show British generosity. The UK was the first European country to send arms with cross-party support. But as support for his leadership at home drained away, Ukraine appeared for him a welcome distraction. In President Zelensky, he found a grateful ally who today expressed sadness. Thank you, Boris Johnson, for understanding the threat of the Russian monster and always being at the forefront of supporting Ukraine. Moscow, by contrast, gloated, with one official saying he'd been hit by his own boomerang. We have a deal with the EU that is ready to go. It is oven ready, as I never tire of it. Is Brexit had propelled Boris Johnson to power. He got his deal, but his plan to override parts of it brought fury in European capitals. And there are few tears being shed in most of Europe tonight at his demise. He is making great progress, so it's an honor to have you here. We're going to be discussing trade. Uh, we can uh, quadruple our trade with UK. Boris Johnson has drawn comparisons with Donald Trump, both populist, controversial leaders. Despite the smiles, relations with Joe Biden are cooler, with no trade deal in sight, and concerns in Washington over Northern Ireland. I think he's seen as a big and charismatic personality, but I'm afraid one that could not be trusted to stick to deals. His word was not his bond. Uh, we are now a country which unilaterally rips up international agreements. I think we're diminished on the international stage and there's ground to be made up. Boris Johnson relished the world stage. He's reordered British foreign policy, but there are, to put it mildly, decidedly mixed views of his overall performance and of the legacy he'll leave.
Caroline Hawley, BBC News. And we'll have more on this major story later in the programme, but Question Time tonight will unusually be shown live tonight at an earlier time of 8pm. That's on the iPlayer online and on the iPlayer app. Strike action by around 700 British Airways check-in staff at Heathrow has been suspended after the union said the airline had made a vastly improved pay offer. The Unite Union said an agreement was reached after extensive talks. Both Unite and GMB union members will now be balanced on the new pay deal. To sport, Northern Ireland's women's football team will play their first game at a major tournament later. The squad, who are made up of mostly part-time players, take on Norway in their opening game of the women's Euros. It's being played at Southampton, where Jane Dougal is for us. And Jane, just how momentous an occasion is this, do you think? George, it's really been a fairy tale story. As you mentioned, none of the squad are professional footballers. They all have day jobs. The squad consists of NHS workers, teachers, and even shop workers. And so just to get to a major tournament is a major achievement in itself. The captain, Marissa Callahan, said it would be every little girl's dream to lead her country out onto a pitch like this. And we're going to be watching her do that in just under 90 minutes time. Now, the Irish FA did fund the team to train full time in the lead up to this tournament, but they are still the lowest ranked country in the Euros. In sharp contrast, their opponents for tonight, Norway, have won the Euros twice. And they also have got a few big names in their squad too including Arda Hegeberg, who is a Champions League winner and a Ballon d'Or winner. But Northern Ireland are not phased by that because when the captain, Marissa Callahan, was asked about Hegeberg, she said, who? We're very much looking forward to kick-off, which will be, as I said, in just under 90 minutes' time. George. All right, Jane, thank you. Tennis now. Wimbledon has reached a semi-final stage in the singles. Cameron Norrie's big opportunity comes tomorrow. But today it was the women's matches on centre court and it's seen quite a breakthrough as Joe Wilson reports. Meet the family. Charlotte's eight, Cecilia just one. Dad, Charles Edouard, is the coach and mum, she's Tatiana Maria, Wimbledon's semi-finalist. Playing against her friend, Anjabur, a groundbreaker for Tunisia, for Africa, for Arab women. An occasion to prove there are different routes to success was a match of touch before power. Jabeur's the number three seed, took the first set 6-2. The play followed an intriguing path. You don't see many winners like this. Oh. Ranked 103 in the world officially, Tatiana Maria at 34 has shown everyone her ability. Well done. But in the end, she was outplayed in this match, 6-1 in the third, and Jabeur becomes the first African woman through to a Wimbledon final in the Open era. But it was a moment to share, as Jabeur made absolutely clear. She's such an inspiration for so many players, and including me, uh, coming back after having two babies. I still can't believe how she did it, but... <laughs> Simona Halep strode towards centre court like the former champion she is, but could not get going in her semi-final. Elena Rabaikina at 23 was playing like the veteran. She grew up in Moscow, represents Kazakhstan and serves like this. Okay. Rabaikina is the official pronunciation. She's officially listed as six feet tall. Her arms are about a mile long. That's how Halep must have felt. All over in two sets. And here's a player no one really expected to get this far. Women's semi-final day, but shall we distract you with a glimpse of tomorrow? Cameron Norrie arrived at the practice course this afternoon, turned a few heads. He's preparing for the biggest match of his life, while his opponent, Novak Djokovic, anticipates another semi-final. He's been through all of this before and enjoys his support here. A big question hanging over Wimbledon right now is whether Rafa Nadal will be fit for his scheduled semi-final tomorrow. We're concerned about that. Right now on centre court, the mixed doubles final is supposed to be underway involving Britain's Neil Skupski. It's been delayed basically because another player involved in that match was in a match which ran long. George, it's a busy day, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Now, back to our main story tonight, the resignation of Boris Johnson. 
How have voters reacted to the news in Macclesfield, a seat that has returned a Conservative MP to Westminster since 1918? Our special correspondent, Ed Thomas, has been finding out. The truest and bluest of Tory safe seats. Macclesfield, a town loyal to the party for a hundred years. But today, Boris Johnson resigning. It's over. Why did it take so long? Why did it take so long? I was dancing in the kitchen, yeah. I bought a bottle of carver to celebrate tonight. It's going in the fridge. John and Joe on grandparent duty and planning a leaving do. What do you think of the man? Narcissistic, psychopathic, selfish, boorish. If Boris Johnson was here now, in Cheshire, what would you say to him? You've been an embarrassment for many years and your incompetence has caught up with you. Millions and millions of people voted for the Conservatives and Boris Johnson in 2019. They wanted him. They, they, they voted on a promise of something that was not going to materialise. Boris Johnson, he's going. What's the reaction? Terrible. Tough to hear for some loyalists like Anne and Julie. I think it's a shame that he's left, and I don't think it's that sensible. You're part of these 14 million who've said, I want Boris Johnson. The 14 million should get together and descend on London. Listening in is Edward, 78, a paid up member of the Conservatives, and furious. Block the town up and tell them, we voted for him, we want him kept. Sounds a bit Donald Trump esque. No, it's not. The only one I would vote for in the Tory party was Boris. Despite all the apologies, despite the misleading of Parliament, despite the parties, despite everything, you want him to stay? Yeah, I do. That's the only reason I voted for him, because of the character of him. But listen to the relief of best friends Anne and Anne. Boris Johnson's gone. Buffoon. Liar. Get out. Each time there's been something that he's done yes. and he's survived and you it's just incredible. you start to lose faith in the whole system. Yes. The because greased piglet, they call him, and that is so apt, the isn't it? Piglet. You couldn't go on any longer. No, I couldn't. Being a Conservative no. member. No, I couldn't stomach it, Ed. I'd had enough. Former Conservative councillor Andrew Gregory, so disillusioned in Boris Johnson, he quit. I will not be rejoining the party. I'm so disappointed with the things that I've seen happen. Millions of people put their faith in Boris Johnson. Indeed. In working class communities. Yeah. They wanted levelling up. Yeah. I wonder whether if the vote came again, they'd have that same certainty and satisfaction in that, in that in individual. Row, 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 the new chapter will soon free. begin, but will old divisions remain? A Thomas, BBC News, Macclesfield. Ah! Let's return now to Downing Street and our political editor, Chris Mason. Chris, there's always a, a danger, I suppose, on days like this at getting caught up in Westminster process in the bubble. Just tell me what do you think. Where does this leave Britain today? Well, Boris Johnson climbed high and fell fast, didn't he? He was a convention-smashing, rule-bending, primary colours prime minister who won big and then was defeated by his own party within a matter of just a couple of years. So where does it leave us tonight? It leaves us on the brink of a beauty pageant to select our next prime minister that excludes the vast majority of us. Now that is conventional in a parliamentary democracy, for better or worse, because parliamentary parties select their leaders, we as voters do not. So for many of us, we are spectators to a race that will follow, lasting weeks or months, who will decide who is the next leader of the Conservative Party. And that will reshape our politics and reshape the discussion and the debate at Westminster and, crucially, reshape the platter of leaders and their parties that we do get to select by the time of the next general election. All right, Chris, thank you very, very much. Well, let's uh, get the weather now with Louise Lear. And I've just been seeing there's an awful lot of cloud in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. I keep promising you the sunshine, don't I? Yeah. I know looking at this, you probably think, She's not delivering, but trust me, we got there in the end today. Finally, some sunshine came through. It was a glorious start into eastern Scotland, but eventually that cloud melted away across England and Wales. Absolutely beautiful afternoon for many. Don't take my word for it. Just take a look at this Swansea. Absolutely glorious afternoon. Not quite so glorious.
yes, I know, in Highland. And here the cloud was thick enough for a little spot or two of drizzle today. And that's going to continue tomorrow as well. So what's happening? We were still under this influence of high pressure and that's going to stay with us as we move into the weekend. But this is the weather front that's continuing to bring in this nuisance cloud into the far northwest. That stays across northwest Scotland and maybe northern fringes of Northern Ireland overnight tonight. But elsewhere we keep those clear skies. Temperatures holding up though, perhaps low to mid double digits first thing in the morning. But I can offer you more sunshine tomorrow. From the word go, in actual fact, a beautiful start for many. That frontal system still producing some nuisance drizzly rain into the far northwest, maybe into Northern Ireland as well, but only the north coast. Elsewhere there'll be lots of sunshine. And where we've got those sunshine, well the temperatures will really start to pick up, stretching from 21 in eastern Scotland to 28 degrees. That's 82 Fahrenheit in the southeast corner. And something you might have to think about, which we haven't just recently, is actually UV high to very high for some areas of England and Wales. And you might need the sunscreen as we head into the weekend as well. The high pressure stays with us. Even the weather fronts will start to drift that little bit further north. So it's more of an optimistic picture for all of us as we move through the weekend. There's going to be a lot of fun warm sunny weather and those temperatures again peaking into the high 20s george nice one thanks louise and that's all from us this evening uh, but before we go and the news where you are let's have a look back at boris johnson's time as prime minister we're going to come out of the eu no ifs or buts wonderful to see this new team assembled here the decision to advise Her Majesty to prorogue Parliament was unlawful. You must stay at home. I've developed mild symptoms of the coronavirus. The NHS has saved my life, no question. GPs are doing an incredible job of getting those jabs into, into people's arms. Yes! Uh, so now I went, uh, as, as we all must, uh, to, to Peppa Pig World. Yes. Mr. Speaker, I want to apologise. I've received a fixed penalty notice from the Metropolitan Police. Above all, I want to thank you, the British public, for the immense privilege that you have given me. Thank you all very much. Thank you.